Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5, part 2 of what we began last week about teaching contrast. Jesus is highlighting the difference between Jewish tradition and kingdom living. We're going to finish out chapter 5 this morning, beginning in verse 33. Let's read together 33 through the end of the chapter. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, Not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only... What do you have more than others? What do you, what do you do more than others? Do you even the tax do not even the tax collectors do so? Pardon me. Therefore, therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Father, you indeed are perfect, and so is your word. And today, Lord, as we look at these verses this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would show us exactly what it is you'd have us to see of ourselves, Lord, and of your nature. Father, I pray that you would just uh, teach us today. Lord, so applicable is your word for today. I pray you would just, again, reveal it to us by the light of your spirit. And Lord, may we not walk away and forget what we've seen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to dive right in this morning. Three more contrasts today. Last week, if you remember, we looked at murder and and a few other things. Today I think you'll find three subject matters that all of us, all of us certainly have familiarity with. And the first is the contrast about the mouth, verse 33 through 37. The contrast about the mouth. First notice the attitude. I'll try to follow the same pattern I did last week. The attitude that currently existed, remember go back to verse 20. It says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So Jesus is basically, right away when he says, you've heard it said to those of old, he's taking the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees, and then he makes the adjustment off of that teaching. So the attitude here, he, he, the focus is on falsely. He says, you've heard you shall not swear falsely. The religious leaders were only concerned with lying in an oath. In other words, perjury. Now, I don't want you to think this morning that Jesus is not concerned with our truth-telling. He, he is concerned, certainly, with lying and perjury. But there's a greater underlying thing here. It's our heart. And so the adjustment is, in verse 34 through 36, he says, Swear not at all. Swear not at all. Now, I've heard over the years of growing up in church, and then since I've been been saved how many lessons i've heard from this and some and and i I want to tell you some of this gets really 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 misused here okay jesus wants to talk to us about the profanity in swearing he's highlighting the profanity in swearing i want you to notice the adjust the expanding in the adjustment notice what he says here not by right what's he say do not swear at all neither by heaven 
for it is God's throne, nor by the earth it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, right? goes on to say, even by your head, for you cannot make one hair black or gray. Evidently, he preached this before just for men came out. <clears throat> but what's the point that he's saying there? All those things, that entire list is related to God, right? He says the heavens, the earth, Jerusalem, even your head, right? Those are things related to God. And so the idea here is, right, is that we are using God, using God to validate our word. Now, sometimes you hear it explained this simply. Somebody says, you should never swear by God, right? That's, and that's how we say it and we kind of leave it at that. But what are we talking about this morning? What is Jesus trying to get across to us? Well, he expands it a little bit to, to the, the explanation of it is this. To swear by such in a casual setting is perjury. Is, is not perjury, is profanity. You shall not use the Lord God, your, your, the Lord your God's name in vain. Boy, my brain is in seven places this morning. Y'all pray for me. Right? We should not use the Lord's name in vain. If I, in a casual setting, swear and swear upon anything that's God's, I am using profanity. You see, we always think of profanity as foul language or foul words. Well, I want to say something to you. Using God's name in any way that's not bringing him glory and honor is profanity. It is. So that's what Jesus is saying. To swear by such in a casual setting is profanity now let me let me clarify something there's nothing wrong with an oath in its proper setting there's nothing wrong with being sworn in in court there's nothing wrong with an oath that we make in marriage in our vows there's nothing wrong with those things Deuteronomy 6 13 says you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and you shall take oaths in his name so in the right context in the right setting there is nothing in and of itself evil about oaths. Y'all with me this morning? But it's when we casually say in some flippant way, I swear to God, this, 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 this. That's profanity and that's what Jesus is saying. You see, again, the religious leaders, all they cared about was whether you perjured yourself before the court. Jesus is concerned with our attitude towards who he is. And when we don't have the right attitude and when we use that in a flippant way, it absolutely is profanity. Now, he gives us an action to use to prevent swearing. Y'all ready for this? It's really, really complicated. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. In other words, let your speech, right? Let your speech be straight and true. Period. Let your speech be what it is and stand on what and stand on what it is. If we have to add qualifiers and do this and say that and, and you know, look, how many people start a tale this way? I want to tell you something and I'm not lying. <clears throat> If you have to start with that disclaimer, maybe perhaps you've lied a, two, uh, a tad or a bit too much in the past, right? Even, even some of us who like to, you know, tell jokes and, and maybe say things that aren't true to life. But if we have to start with, I'm not lying. I want to tell you, th this is not a lie. How many of you does that give comfort to when somebody has to start right with, Jesus says, listen, state the facts, and the facts will be the facts. Y'all know what happens when you tell one lie? What do you have to do? Tell another lie, right? The problem with telling lies is we forget what lie we told. You ever have somebody tell you a story, and then they tell you the story later, and you notice a lot of the facts changed, right? Like how big that bass was Jack caught. And then the next time he tells you, it gained weight somehow. I don't know how that happens, right? Or the, or the deer, you know, we, we tell stories. And listen, if we just told the facts, later we can say, I don't remember the exact, you know, but here's the best I remember. But we tell something and we just flippantly use our language. 
Jesus says, listen, I want, I want to help you not profane yourself. Just say the truth. Is that so difficult, church? Before you go, no, then why do we do it all the time? Why do we do it all the time? A profane man is a corrupt man. And the same with a society. The same with society. We are a flowery speech people. Just watch ads. I've said this before. Just watch ads. They spend all this eloquent speech telling you how their medicine works. And then he changed his voice, and at the end it says, may cause all the following things. Right? I don't want you to hear this as loud and, and as bold as I said how good my product was. I'm just going to try to wing these by you, right? <clears throat> I want to tell you the list at the bottom is usually worse than the one you're trying to cure. I'll keep the hiccups. I want my hair and all the rest that you just said will fall out. That's how we are as a society and as a people. And we laugh about that, but I want to say something. We need to be people who say what we mean and mean what we say. That's the crux of what Jesus is, is, is implying there. Not implying, that's what he's teaching there. We need to be careful with our mouths, church. Don't use flowery language. So that's the contrast about the mouth. Now let's talk about the contrast about meekness, verse 38 through 42. You've heard that it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Anybody ever heard that? Live by that? I hope not. Well, what is the attitude? First, we see the, the properness of it. That came straight from the law of Moses. However, it was meant for criminals. It was meant for somebody who had committed a crime. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm not sure when you trade teeth, but, but that was in the law. That's how it was written. So in its proper context, it was right. But the perversion of it was this. It was taken out of context, taken out of context to excuse retaliation. How many of you like to get even? No hand will go up, I guarantee you, you lying bunch of heathens. Finally, Jack broke down, right? Yeah, we like to get even. It's in every fiber of who we are. I'm going to get you. Jesus says, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. In its proper context, listen, it's meant for the law, not meant to excuse retaliation. So then he gives us this adjustment. Here's another one of those little things I pulled out because Matthew is so confounding to a new believer. If he reads this phrase, look what he says. Not to resist an evil person. Verse 39. I tell you not to resist an evil person. A new believer might read that and go, oh, well, if they're evil, I'm just supposed to let them have their way with me, right? No. What is he talking about? That, not talking about giving evil its way. This means not returning evil for evil when dealing with a personal affront. How many of you have been offended this week? Anybody been offended? Man, y'all must live in a bubble or something. So nobody's been offended. We don't get offended, preacher. It happens all the time, either on a small matter or a big matter. We get offended. Jesus is saying, listen, when it comes to your personal situation, we should never return evil for evil. So he gives us four applications. And remember, all these applications in the right context are dealing with personal re retaliation. The cheek application. Let's look at the applications. The cheek applications. Someone smites you on the right cheek. Turn the other cheek. Does that mean I'm not to defend myself if I'm being attacked? Absolutely not. 
ladies, if somebody accosts you in the parking lot, you go spider monkey on them and you fight with every fiber of your being. Gentlemen, if somebody is attacking you with the idea of harming you, you defend yourself. That is not what the implication here is, that we are just to be doormats for the world. That's not what it's talking about. As a matter of fact, we can even rebuke the one who is our striker. John 18, 22 and 23, Jesus is before Pilate. And after he answered Pilate, one of the guards struck him on the face. And Jesus said, have I, have I spoke evil or done, you know, have I spoke a, a, a lie? In verse 23, he says, then why did you smite me, right? He rebuked the one who struck him. This is not talking about us not having any recourse of action if we're being attacked. This is simply implying that maybe we're having a, a difference of opinion and someone suddenly strikes us on the face, but there's no indication they're going to continue to do so. Then it takes a bigger man to just offer the left cheek than it does to retaliate. Isn't that difficult? Can I tell you the things Jesus tells you to do is never easy for you, but it's easy for him? Can you imagine what he suffered on his way to the cross? The, script, the scripture tells us a great deal of it. One of the greatest examples of this very teaching, turn the other cheek. Now Jesus had a greater purpose in mind. He was headed for the cross. Listen. He was headed for the cross and there was nothing going to keep him from the cross. But imagine having your beard plucked and your face spit upon and being slapped and ridiculed and all the things he did and he suffered it silently. We are not good at suffering silently. We love to protest loudly. And Jesus is saying here, just let things be. The cheek application. Turn the other cheek if that's a possibility. Secondly, the cloak application. Verse 40. He says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. We live in the most litigious times ever, 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 ever in, our, in the history of the world. Everybody wants to sue somebody. As a matter of fact, just go somewhere and order the hottest beverage they have and spill it on yourself because you're a clumsy oaf and, set and sue them because their, their hot soup was hot. That's America. And you'll be a millionaire. That's America. So sue, being sued is a very possibility in today's world. But what he's talking about here in the cloak application is the retaliation against justice. Now I'm going to give you a few examples of this. Let's say uh, you haven't paid your car payments. Y'all know what they do when you don't pay your car payments? Your boat payment, your, your plane payment, anybody got a plane? They have the right to come and repossess what is theirs. Now, what is the nature of our flesh? Oh, you're coming to get your car back? Well, I'll damage it before you do. Y'all realize how often that happens? You didn't pay the payment. You failed to meet your end of the bargain. All they're doing is reclaiming what is rightfully theirs. But we, in our retaliation against, against justice here, we go, oh, well, you can get it, but it, it'll be tore all to pieces when you get it. If we find ourselves in court, this is what Jesus is saying, and you are being sued, you don't retaliate against the judgment. You go even further than the judgment. I heard a case one time, it maybe happened more than once, where a fellow lost a case in court and he had to pay some money. So guess what he did? He got all the money converted to pennies and backed up a whole dump truck in the, in the person's yard and dumped all the coins in the front yard. Boy, what a big man, right? But aren't we that way sometimes? Now, I don't know of any of us in here who are facing litigation, but if we are, remember what Jesus said. If he takes your tunic, give him your cloak also. 
So we have the cheek application, the cloak application, the compelling application. Now, you read this and probably go, when would that ever happen? Verse 41. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. In those days, a soldier could compel a citizen to carry his gear, his equipment for him. Walk through the town, tired, hey you, come here, carry my shield, carry my whatever. And he says, you carry it as far as I want you to carry it. Whew. Well, what does Jesus say? Don't do it. No, he says, do exactly as he says. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. Now, why? And, and I want to say, when I first started thinking about this this week to teach it, I was thinking, I don't know that that happens that much, but oh boy, does it. Here's what Jesus is saying. We're to go the extra mile, in other words, to do the bare minimum is a form of retaliation. To do the bare minimum is a form of retaliation. So if that soldier asks you to carry his equipment for one mile and you're over there, 5,180, you know, as soon as you get to a mile, here you jerk, take your stuff back, right? That's the attitude we have a lot of times today when we are asked by somebody or compelled by somebody to do something. We begrudgingly do it right to the very closest nth of a degree to what they ask us to do and then we hear, right? Kids, listen to me. This is, happens a lot. Oh, boy. When your parents ask you to do something, they've compelled you to do something. And you don't want to do it. And you barely, barely meet the definition of what they ask you to do. Hey, would you straighten your room up? Right? So you go and kick everything under the bed? I'm done. This has never happened in any teenager's life ever, has it? Right? We do it at work. Boss gives us a directive. We don't like it. I'll do it, but by gosh, I'll barely do it. I'm going to scrape by by the skin of my teeth. That's a form of retaliation because we didn't like what we were told to do. Jesus says if you're asked to do something, do it even further than you're asked to do. Imagine what kind of impact that would have on the people around you. Look, Mom, not only did I straighten my room up, but I did things that I've never done before. I dusted. I discovered some archaeological things on my dresser. Look, Mom, I, I arranged my closet. Hey, boss, you know you wanted me to do this? Well, I also did this and this and this. These are, church, these aren't earth-shattering sins right that's what we think but can I ask you a question if this were the only sin in your life would Jesus still have had to go to the cross yes Jesus doesn't waste his time teaching us things that don't matter and he says if somebody asks you to do something they compel you to do it then go the extra mile don't retaliate Last, we have the charity application, verse 42. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So I read this and go, oh, anybody who asks me for something, I'm going to give it to him. No. We're, we're still in the context of retaliation. We're still in the context of retaliation. And so basically what he's saying here is, not implying that we're to give anyone whatever they ask for, but in the context, we are not to withhold as a form of retaliation. In other words, if, if John, in normal circumstances, I went to him and said, John, my kids are hungry. Never mind, that wouldn't be what I'd ask. John, if, if you know, my car needs fixing, could you, would you loan me $100? If ordinarily, John would say, Absolutely, brother. Here's $100. Glad to do it. 
if that's our ordinary arrangement, if I were to offend John and later go back and say, hey, would you loan me $100? And in the back of his mind goes, no. I remember what you did to me the other day, and I'm still mad about it. You're not getting anything from me. You see the difference in that? It's not about giving anybody anything that you would that they ask, but it's about in this idea of retaliation when we are asked if it's something we would ordinarily done, we should not let our own offense keep us from doing good. How often, church, and, and I want to stay right there for a minute, how often do we let an offense keep us from doing good? Often. We let little hurts and little little disagreements and little problems and little things in life and we hang on to them and we make so much out of them how many people have gotten mad because somebody walked by them in the hallway and, and didn't say good morning with the right tone of voice we laugh because we know it's true they got to my pew before I did and sat in my spot Parked in my parking place. How dare they even exist. And we take a little small thing, right? Like, like Just like that oyster takes that little piece of sand. And oh boy. Next thing you know, we got a pearl of hate. And we won't give them the time of day. I'm, oh boy. Anybody ever said that? I wouldn't give him the time of day. I'm not making this stuff up. I've heard you say it. You know what? I've said it. Shame on me. Because I've allowed some little thing in my life to affect me in a way that causes me not to love like I should. Contrast about malice. Verse 43 through 48. The last one he talks about here is love. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hmm. This was the attitude of the teaching that the Pharisees were offering that day. Love your neighbor but hate your enemy. Anybody seen that in the word? It's not in the word. But this is what was being taught by the Pharisees. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Well, what if your enemy is your neighbor? I'd like to see them fix that one. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Nowhere in the Word of God are we ever taught to hate except sin. Nowhere. So the attitude was a half-truth. Now, what's the problem with a half-truth? Because it sounds okay, but it's completely wrong. I, I want you to, to know this morning that is Satan's favorite form of truth, a half-truth. Love, love, your, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Half-truth. How, how many of those do we walk around with in our lives Jesus gives an adjustment, one phrase. I say to you, love your enemies. If I can love my enemies, that makes my neighbors a walk in the park. Now, how many of you find that teaching to be some of the most difficult teaching in the entire Bible? I don't care what you scrounge through from Genesis to Revelation. If you find something much more difficult than the thought of loving your enemy then I want to hear it. Now, listen to me. This is not a command on you. This is a command on Christ in you. If you are capable of loving your enemy of yourselves, then you wouldn't need Christ, but you aren't, and he's able, so he is. Love your enemy. Now, I want to ask you a question. Does anybody come to your mind when you hear that phrase? 
Love your enemy. What an adjustment. I, I can only imagine the, the spiritual leaders of that day standing on the periphery as Jesus was teaching. And when he said that, whoo, love my enemies. You mean like Samaritans? You mean like them people over there? Yeah, all of them. All of them. Love your enemy. He gives them three, three ways there to love. The latter part of verse 44 says, Bless those who curse you. In other words, love with our mouths. Do you know that we often fan the flames of our own bitterness with our words? It's one thing to be aggravated and agitated and maybe have some ill feelings in your heart that you're dealing with. But the more you begin to manifest that in your speech, right? Somebody says, hey, you seen old Fred lately? I always try to think of a name that's not here. If there's any Freds, forgive me, right? You seen old Fred lately, right? And you've, you've got a little alt against Fred and you're thinking, and so you, you, you want to repress it, but oh... Well, let me tell you about Fred. And we begin. And Lord forbid that person feed back into it. Yeah, I don't like Fred either, right? We'll have ourselves a buffet of Fred before it's over with. And our words begin to fan the flames of what we should have been suppressing. And now we are fanning the flames of those, that bitterness or that anger and it begins to grow and grow and grow. So he says, bless those who curse you. Hey, you seen old Fred? No, I haven't, but I would love to see him. I love Fred. He is a dear friend of mine. He is a good man. He's whatever we Listen, when you begin to speak good words about Fred, it may taste funny when you first start, right? But the more you do it, I don't mean do it lyingly. I don't mean to make it up. Don't say anything about Fred that isn't, Fred, isn't true. But bless Fred and not curse Fred. Again, this sounds so simple, but obviously it's not. Love with your mouth. Secondly, love right with your manners. Love with your manners. Do good to those who hate you. How many of you this year, when you were making out your Christmas card list, started with the people who hate you? Anybody? Did we even include them on the list? No, because they hate us. Well, if we began to speak blessings on them and to do good for them, we might get off the list that they hate us. Do good. Do good. Watched a little bit of football last night. I, I don't know why the football now feel, feels like it has to be the voice of reason in America. Slogans everywhere on the shirts and the hats. And last night on the back of a helmet it said, be love. I was, it compelled me to run out and hug somebody. <laughs> Be love. Can I tell you, you can't be love. You have to show love. You can wear hearts and all kinds of mushy, gushy, stereotype statements on your shirt all you want to. But if that's all you do, you are not doing good. He says, love with your mouth. Let your words bless those who curse you even when they're cursing you. Do good to those who hate you. So love with your manners. Exodus gives us an example, 23, 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. Not shoo it further in the woods or enjoy it for dinner.
How often do we think, boy, who, who, really, who really could use some peace today? Who can I reach out to that maybe we've had a strained relationship for years now? We've just decided we won't even talk to each other or about each other. I've just forgotten them. Jesus says, love with your mouth, love with your manners. And maybe the most difficult one is love with our meditations. He says, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Oh, man. Wow. Wow. Holy work is sometimes hard work. Holy work is sometimes hard work. It's not always easy to pray for somebody who you have nothing but animosity towards. But one of the fastest ways to lose animosity is to pray. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It went up a notch each time. Pray. It's one of the reasons why, the, why so many in the church don't pray for our, our politicians and our leaders of our country today. When I read that verse, I, it doesn't say pray for the leaders who please you. Pray for all of them. Church can I ask you a question. Can you imagine what would happen if every born-again believer in Jesus Christ prayed for our president every single day, would it make a difference? If every single believer prayed every single day for God to change his heart, you think it would change anything? If it didn't change one thing, it would change your attitude about him. Jesus says, love with your mouth, love with your manners, love with your meditations. He gives an attestation to it in verse 45. In other words, a testimony. He says, this behavior will confirm that we are a child of God. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, this behavior is not going to make you a son of God, but it will verify to the world that you are who you say you are. Isn't that what we want, church? Our testimony to match up with what we say? Our walk to match our talk? He gives an assessment in verse 46 and 47. To not do so makes us no different than the world. If I'm going to be offended about everything and just lash out at everybody, I'm exactly like the world. And I've become no benefit. We go back to what we preached when he said, if salt loses its saltiness, this is the exact thing. If we're going to behave the way the world does, we've lost our saltiness. I would not want to be an RS, R, RS agent and read this because he talks about tax collectors quite a bit. But he says, you're no different, Right? You're no different. And by the way, tax collectors can be wonderful children of God. But we're just like the world. Is that what Jesus died for, church? That we could be just like we were when we were lost? Imagine the shame of that. Imagine the shame. Imagine for a moment if, if, you're, if one of your loved ones was an organ donor... Follow me for just a moment. If one of your loved ones was an organ donor and you found out that, that their lungs went to this person and you got the person's name so you could go meet them. So your loved one died and gave up their lungs for this person. And when you meet that person, one behind another, chain smoking. How would you feel about that? I'm glad you got my brother's lungs, my father's lungs, my sister's lungs so that you could foul them up with the stench of nicotine. Is that why? Oh, and this is why I needed them in the first place, right? 
The reason Christ went to the cross was because we were dead in our sins and trespasses. I think the fact that he has rescued us from that and given us his righteousness qualifies us, listen, should, should compel us, rather, to live a life that reflects what has happened in us. Did Jesus pay it all? Then he deserves our all. It seems like such simple little truths today, but some that I know I have trouble with, and I'm sure most of you do too. The action to prevent malice. Verse 48. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What's the extent of the goal? Perfect. Anybody reached it yet? Keep that in mind when you want to judge one another. We're all still on the track racing for perfection. If I'm a little slower than you, please forgive me. But as long as I'm on course, just encourage me. Be perfect. Be perfect. The example of the goal is your Father in heaven. Was Jesus perfect? He was. Did he live in a perfect world? No, he didn't. Did he hang around only perfect people? No, he didn't. Was he surrounded by sin? Yes, he was. My point is this. Jesus lived a perfect life in the same environment that you and I live in today. No different. The Bible says he was tempted in every way known to man. Perfection is our goal. Christ is our ability. But I think most days we just get up hoping for about 80%. If I can be good 80% of the time and 20% be me, eh, I'll take that. So we sing Jesus died for 80% of our day. Well, 80% includes night while I'm sleeping, of course. You see, when you think about it that way, it matters how we behave. Even in the small areas of life, yeah, these aren't, you know, if I ask you to name 10 of the worst sins you could commit, I doubt any of the three that we talked about today would be on your list, yet here's Jesus at, at the very beginning of one of the greatest sermons ever delivered on the face of the earth saying these very things. The standard of man is substandard. His standard is higher always. And our goal should be perfection. And it begins with our heart and mind. Perfection begins with our heart and mind. That pursuit. That's why he said it's not about the external things. It's about the internal things. So after we finish those six, I wonder... Which, of, which do you live more closely to? The Pharisee way or Jesus' way? They're not the same. We weren't saved to be Pharisees. We were saved to be perfect through the blood of Christ. Now, I don't mean we're, we're, we are going to be perfect people. But that should be what we strive for every single day day are we satisfied with just so so church in the area of our mouth in the area of malice in the area of meekness i pray that you would let jesus be jesus in you that you might excel in all these areas let's bow in prayer father we love you this morning thank you lord for teaching us today lord i know it was a little different uh, today as we looked at some things that maybe we don't think are that important but, Father, they're in your word, and therefore they're important. So, Lord, I pray this morning you might take your word and apply it to us that we might, Lord, make application. Because I'm sure we've all failed in many areas. Lord, teach us to love our enemies. 
Oh, how it would change the world if we could simply come to love our enemies. Father, first of all, this morning I pray you might point out to us, <clears throat> those of us who are here this morning, who don't know Christ. Father, without Christ and without your spirit, we have no ability to live a perfect life, to live a life pleasing to you. Lord, I pray you might save them today. Lord, and I pray for the rest of us who are your children, that we might live like you're our father. Live like you are our father. Lord, have your way with us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>